bull, as, you know, the main, its main creature base, uh, and Phantasmal Image should be good against all of those cards. You know, uh, previously the Blue Black Zombie decks always had to play a bunch of cards that were pretty stinky in the first game. You know, yeah. you had some Fume Spitters in there, sometimes you had a main deck, some Nile Spell Bombs, but Blood Artist really changes that. And because of Blood Artist is being printed, you don't have to play all those bad cards anymore. So you get less of these draws where you're playing with mediocre limited cards. Right. Michael Marlowe has really gone in on that. He has a full set of Blood Artists, also with three Mortar Pods and the two Killing Waves. He's really hoping to gain a lot of value out of those Blood Artists in this matchup. So what I would say is probably the most important card then for Brad defensively here is going to be Blade Splicer. The three power is just enough power really to put it out of range of a lot of Michael's creatures and so that we, if he can get an early hands with early blade splicers will I think for sure be keeps here yeah I mean uh, blade splicer in uh, rather historically has been incredible against any sort of zombies deck right um, I haven't played against the zombies deck with uh, blood artist when I've had blade splicer in a, uh, a snapcaster blue white deck but I can tell you from experience that I used to play Blade Splicer in Delver, and I would play against the zombie deck from time to time, Magic Online. And if I drew a Blade Splicer, right, that's a spot traditionally, traditionally occupied by Geist of Saint Traft, and it's kind of one of the things that makes this blue-white mid-range deck really different than the Delver style decks, is that it's playing four Blade Splicer in the slot where you'd normally see four Geist of Saint Trafts. And um, also where it's different, it has two Gideon Jura and two Tamiyo the Moon Sage in the main deck instead of any Delver of Secrets. So it's going, it's definitely going a little bit bigger, which I think will serve it well in this matchup. Definitely. All right, so... Uh... So Brad Shepard is the overall one seed in this tournament. So he will be on the play any match where he's still in the tournament. So he gets to lead off here with Island into Ponder. Yep, and... Let's see what he can find here. He chooses to shuffle up. Yeah, Ponder, because he's not playing cards like Delver, Ponder isn't as big of a backbone to Brad's deck. It's still obviously a very good card, as, you know, it lets him shuffle here, which is something he really needs. But, uh, it's you know, he doesn't have to. In Delver, sometimes you really want to play your Ponders for a lot of value. Brad can be, feel free to burn them off a little bit quicker. And a uh, turn one Diagra Diagraph Ghoul for Michael Marlowe. And Ismar is pretty good. Yeah, the one drops are really potent in the blue in all the zombies decks. Uh, they're and Michael's deck is no different. Let's see, does he have a blood artist here? Or a grave crawler? So four power on the tail for Michael Marlowe and he passed the turn there, but Vapor Snag turning it back to two. Yeah, I really do like the the, the play from Brad Shepard. He needs to just get a little bit of extra time. And then out down comes a turn three Blade Splicer from Brad Shepard. So now Michael's going to have to have some sort of answer to that. Uh, in his deck for removal, what is Michael Marlowe? Has uh, Tragic Slip, Mortar Pod, Geth's Verdict, and Killing Wave. So none of those actually by themselves get rid of the 3-3 three, three Golem, get rid of the 3-3 three, three Golem from Blade Splicer. So, you know, Brad's going to get Geth's Verdict. He has to pick which of these two creatures he wants. Uh, he'll keep the 3-3 three, three over the 1-1. One, one. Basically, the only reason he might not make that decision is if he has a Restoration Angel in his hand. Probably safer just to have the big creature, though. Yeah, and Michael there, spending three mana and two for wanting himself to deal with that Blade Splicer. Right, and that really shows that Vapor Snag play. Very relevant, because now Michael is only able to hit in for two after doing all those plays. So, pretty nice there. Yeah, Brad's going to try to reload here. He has a Ponder. It looks like he's Ponder is into a Snapcaster, another Ponder, and a Mana Leak. Um... Yeah, he's gonna have. I'm have to think he's gonna keep this. And he only passes the turn with his mana leak up. I'm gonna take another two damage here. Yeah, Marlowe will knock him down to 13. Um, probably just will try to commit some small stuff to the board. Maybe just a Diagraph Ghoul. Ideally, he'd play Diagraph Ghoul here and then play more Grave Crawlers um, if that's options available to him. He'll go for Blood Artist, that'll get mana leaked. Brad needs to make sure that he gets that mana leaked, that he does something with his mana this turn. So, ponder, ponder for Michael. And, you know, that's kind of just a great addition to any deck. Michael's deck, not the easiest to cast Ponder when you're playing Michael's deck. Uh, but, no. Uh, still, I, th I think it's fine. 
Yeah, well, he has his, he has his eight duels, which I believe are all of his blue. He has all of his blue sources. He also has three cavern of souls, which won't cast ponder, but will help in a pinch cast a phantasmal image. So, Brad will play that ponder that he got last turn. So, ponder. Gonna yes. help fix Brad's hand now. Yep, the snapcaster is still on the top of the deck. Uh, I think the other two are two more spells. I believe one of them is another mana leak. It's kind of a question whether Brad still wants another one at this point. The cards, if Michael has more lands, are going to become dead very quickly in this matchup. Michael's converted mana cost in the average converted mana cost in his deck is fairly low. I think Brad's got to be concentrated on really winning here. He's got to be able to do something back to Michael Marlowe. Yeah, and letting his life total get this low, uh, Michael's deck has a surprising amount of reach for a deck that has no burn spells. Cards like Giralf's Messenger, when in conjunction with Phantasmal, which can deal with a lot of damage. And attempt for Giralf's Messenger, and Michael's and Brad's going to snap a mana leak at that. All right, and Snapcaster Mage trades with Diagraph Ghoul. Brad drops to 11, and now is facing a pair of Grave Crawlers from Michael. Uh, and, uh... Something you should note on this is, uh, you know, generally speaking, if your if your sorcery speed play for the turn does not affect how combat is going to go, wait till after the combat step, right. because your opponent may have some way to interact with it that affects the combat step. So there, here again, he's casting Jarl's Messenger pre-combat. This one's gonna stick. Now, Brad Shepard has a Restoration Angel play, but. That would put him dropping to nine. Remember, while the Restoration Angel can kill a Grave Crawler, it's really only a temperate proposition. This grave, the pair of Grave Crawlers, whichever one is not killed, will do a great job of getting the other one back. Giralf's Messenger is a zombie. All these creatures are really here to stay for the rest of the game, putting Brad in a very tenable position, untenable position. Uh, snap, he's in play Snapcaster Mage, getting Vapor Snag. He's going to Vapor Snag one of the Grave Crawler tokens. Or grave crawlers, so dropping Marlow to a healthy 18. He's going to take the other one going to 7, and Michael will just recast the grave crawler. Alright, so here's Brad's plan. Sort of feast and famine comes down, hooks up with Snapcaster Mage, uh, knocks Michael Marlow down to 14, and gets his last card, which was a Blood Artist. I believe, no, actually, it was another Grolf's Messenger, I believe. Which, that's very scary. Wow. And then post-combat, he's going to play, play Restoration Angel, targeting Snapcaster Mage, Snapcaster targeting the Ponder. And the last card in his hand is, a, is the one of Consecrated Sphinx in his deck. Yeah, now Brad looks to me in solid control here again. Yeah, seven's still a pretty low number. Um, the, pro the bigger problem is that what he is what to do about Garolf's Messenger. I mean, this turn the Restoration Angel can eat it, but it'll still... You know, by turning the team sideways, but Michael can still knock Brad down to about one. You know, Brad will either have to chump, essentially chump with a Snapcaster Mage, or drop to one, which I don't think he can really drop to one here. Yeah, and Michael Marlowe has found a Phantasmal Image, which in conjunction with his Garolf's Messenger, I think Michael will be able to pull through here. Yeah, might just be able to win the game right on the spot. All right, he keeps cards on top and draws. I have to imagine he's drawn the image. And he'll swing the team. Now, uh, Brad, likely to uh, eat the Giralf's Messenger with Restoration Angel. And I think he's just got to throw the Snapcaster Mage in front of the uh, one of the Grave Crawlers. Two life at this point is more important than them. Well, Snapcast if you're Brad and counting, you have to assume that you're actually already at five. You're going to have to kill that Garolf's Messenger at some point, so... Yep, he's going to do that. So he will take four damage, drop to three. Gravecrawler will die for the time being. Michael will be able to just to re... Yep, undie to four or three. Michael will be able to recast the Gravecrawler, and if he casts the image, I, which we think he's kept... Uh, I don't... You know, I think i will put Brad to one and dead on the next turn. Using the image, the Restoration Angel, getting Garolf's Messenger back, putting Brad down to three, down to one, and Gravecrawler. Pretty reasonable. Sure, I mean, at this point, he, yeah, Brad's gonna have to do something about. I don't, don't think Brad will have an out here. Yeah, Garolf's Messenger is going to be a, a, just a, a solid form of inevitability here.
here. All right, and that'll be game one. So Brad, Brad Shepard drops game one. Michael Marlowe up 1-0. Both players, this is, remember, this is the top four of the Standard Open. Both players hoping to have a spot in the finals of, our, of the Open today. Hey, welcome back, guys. So uh, we're going to ask you a quick trivia question. And if you can answer this correctly, you have an opportunity to win six free months of Star City Games Premium. Yeah. Um, Remember, it was three months for the trivia question in the top eight. It is six months for those of you who have woken up early <coughs> to join us right now. Stay with us. During the finals, the prize will be a free Gen Con badge. So remember to uh, tweet your answers to hashtag SCG Premium. Yep. Right um, around that's the most here. Place yep. to tweet them. Uh, if you don't tweet it there, we won't see it. So you can't right. win. Now, the question I have for you guys is there's another tournament happening this weekend. It's an invitational. There was another invitational a few months ago. Now, Somebody won that Invitational, the most recent one, and they're also in the top eight this weekend. I would like to know who that person is. Who is the most recent Star City Games Invitational winner who is currently in the top eight of the Invitational here in Indianapolis? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, th you, <laughs> those of you Never who... Mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> All right. okay, so rather, so there was a player in the top eight of the most recent invitational who did not win, who is also in the top eight of this invitational. I would like to know All right. which player is in the top eight of the Star City Games Indianapolis invitational that was also in the top eight of the uh, Richmond. Baltimore Invitational. The Baltimore Invitational. All right. Uh, who did not win the Baltimore Invitational. So, so we're not asking for Max going, Teats. Yes. Not Max Teats. This player going for, you know, going to redeem himself, hopefully, this time, come home with the trophy. Entered the top eight this weekend, first in the standings. So All he's right. going to get to be on the play every single match here. I'd like to know who this is. Pretty is relevant teacher? in a field of five Delver decks to be on the play. All right, so remember Definitely very relevant, especially ahead, when you're not one of those Delver decks. Right, go ahead and tweet that answer with the hashtag, uh, hashtag star SCG Premium. All right, so we'll we go back. Go ahead and go back to our match here. Uh, on your right, we have we have Michael Marlowe. He has taken the first game from Brad Shepard. And over in our other in our other uh, semifinal, if this one finishes, we'll try to get you to that. We have Ross Miriam playing Blue White Delver against Dan Musser, who we we saw on camera winning with Rug Pod. Believe they we believe they are still in game one though. Uh, the very quick game one over here as Michael Marlowe was able to have a pretty unanswerable aggro curve. Yeah, I mean when you have uh, Diagraph Ghoul, Double Grave Crawler into Double Giraffe's Messenger. Uh, even when your opponent sort of feasts and famines away, the second drops messenger, uh, a ponder to a phantasmal, which will usually be enough to lock it up. Yeah. What's really interesting with the zombies decks and how they play is that when you have grave crawlers into Grolf's messengers, it doesn't even matter when your creatures die. None of them are actually like your creatures getting killed isn't isn't particularly a problem for your deck. Yeah, the undead. Well, I mean, Wizards has uh, successfully. Uh, Critic cards that play with the flavor that's intended. Yeah. And these zombie cards don't die. No, they do just keep coming back. I, I kind of like that. I think uh, Wizards is doing a much better job as time goes on of making cards affect the game how you would expect them to, based on uh, you know their flavor. I mean, supposed to say skate zombies or <laughs> did you say <laughs> supposed to skate zombies who are just Bears that they say zombie on them. No, and they have pictures of zombies on them, but no. I, I recently really uh, previewed Ordric. I don't know if you saw it uh, from M13, also going to be in uh, Duels of the Planeswalkers 2013. Ordric and is the soldier captain, correct? Yes, the uh, the three four first strike. And when he attacks with three other gentlemen, you can set up combat however you like. Yes, it reminds me of the card Master Warcraft. Actually, he. Basically, he yeah, basically uh, engages Master Warcraft. Right? Um, it's uh, actually it from Ravnica. It's from Ravnica block. Okay. It's a Boros rare. Yeah, red white. Yes, so he essentially he, he it has enacts a Minotaur him. on it, I think. Yeah, he enacts <laughs> Master Warcraft upon your opponent when he attacks. 
Yeah, um, I mean, that's a really flavorful card. It makes sense. You know, here's a guy who makes battle plans. Mm -hmm. you know, if you've got three or more guys to go along with him, he's got an army, then he can come up with a plan. So, yeah, a little bit better than just having all your creatures become unblockable. That's an option, and oftentimes how you'll play the card. But no, sometimes, actually, if your creatures are bigger, it can be a lot more than that. Yeah, I mean, if you have a... Uh, the fact that there's a 3-4 involved, right. that is first strike. Well, yeah, it's a very good-sized creature to begin with. Yeah, I mean, he can take out a reasonable number of things. I, I don't know how good it is, as long as... Certainly in Limited, I would say it's an excellent card. Oh, in Limited, it's absurd. Yeah, I mean, attacking with... So he has to attack with three others, or be part of a three-creature attack? With three others. So four creatures total. Yes. So... You instructed, uh, you know, if you're playing against people who have board sweepers, it's just... So limited, it seems like how that would play out. It's you'd essentially build a more defensive deck, which is great because you're playing white, and white's excellent doing that. But then once you finally have assembled enough creatures, you can turn your defense into an offense rather potently by just picking off most of their creatures. Yeah, you can, you know, make their 5-5 five, five block your 6-6, six, six, their 3-3 three, three block your 4-4, four, four, mm -hmm. all their 2-2s two block your 3-3s, three, and then <laughs> whatever they have left over just won't block. <laughs> sure, if, there's, if they do have something that's too big, that creature just will not block. So you get to pick off all their small creatures if you'd like. Uh, a little bit of mulliganing it looks like going on here. Yeah, I imagine both players going to six now. From the looks of things. Yeah, both players on six cards. Uh, and six cards so far. Now, uh, I'm pretty surprised to see a uh, blue-black zombie deck this deep. Five no, it, yeah, it's really, exci it's really exciting uh, of a deck that he's been playing. Um, especially the, the killing, wa killing wave for Blood Artist aspect of it to me is really what I think is exciting about his deck. Yeah, it's something that, uh, you know, Conley Woods was attempting to do that in uh, Barcelona. All right, Not so sure how well it worked out for him. But, but we're going to start here. No, Michael Marlowe is going to go to five cards. Ooh. And that's a little rough. He's going to six now? Okay, sorry. He's going oh, he's to six, six cards. Yeah. All right. Well, I had, uh, I thought they were already melting. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe just Brad was. And just Michael had so we have a seven yeah. on six. So post board, looking at things. Right. Michael Marlow uh, has access to some fume spitters. Not sure if those are going to come in here. Uh, they really uh, only they'll get Snapcaster Mage and they'll get Blade Splicer. So in theory you could do them, but I, I probably don't like them in the sense of he already has three mortar pods in his deck. I like that so much more against that effect. Really, the way you're beating the blue white mid range isn't by attacking their X ones. The X ones aren't the cards that really matter. It's the angels. And the bl and the three three golem tokens that you need to kill. So I would I'd probably just say that the mortar pods are enough there. Yeah, I think uh, Nile Spellbomb. Nile Spellbomb's pretty good. It's a pretty good free roll Could against Snapcaster Mage. I mean, he has some cards that are really weak here against Vapor Snacks. So he's got to bring in something. Uh, it doesn't really look like there's that much that he wants. Skurstog High Priest might actually be a fine card to board in here. Hmm. Uh, a five five token, five five demon tokens. Outside of Vapor Snag is a very good card, um, and a lot of because Brad's playing a lot of X one like a lot of creatures that can just incidentally die. I, I might like that. Michael Marlow is going to five, so it's going to be a little bit I more have difficult. Kept that hand. Did you have a chance to see what was in it? Um, I saw two phantasmal images, a cavern of souls, swamp swamp, and uh, black spells. Two black spells. Or one black spell then. Or one black spell, rather. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think the danger with that is if, say, Brad Shepard has kept a hand of lands, mana leak. Well, I'm not sure the mana leaks are still in, but, you know, land, yeah. Let's say right now, if I said his hand was land, land, mana leak, mana leak, ponder, restoration angel, restoration angel, uh, Michael Marlowe might be in the kind of situation where he's done before he can even play anything. When I, or at least when you're zombies play, you'd see that kind of pattern, you'd worry about that scenario playing out. All right, so Brad starts out. And that's reasonable. I mean, I, I don't think Brad's going to have mana leaks in his deck post board. Probably not. Not many, if, if any at all. Um, actually, what Brad does have post board is very strong. He has an extra sort of feast and famine. He has two phantasmal image, which will almost certainly heal up his heal up his clone count. He has two day of judgment, which I think he he becomes much more of a classic control deck. 
He also has two Heroes of Blade Hold. I'm not positive that those... I do believe those come in in this matchup. So turn three Blade Splicer, answered by a turn three Garolf's Messenger. For Michael's five, it's a pretty good five. As he has a, if you look at his hand, he has a Phantasmal Image as well to go on his own Garolf's Messenger. Wow. Yeah, now uh, Brad Shepard has that Blade Splicer. We talked about how good that is against the zombie stack, and here we're watching that. He has Oblivion Ring in his hand, which would be... You may not know that the clone's hiding out in Marlo's hand, but if he did, I think that would be easily be his play as that on the Garolf's Messenger. He's gonna go with the second blade splicer instead. May end up may end up regretting that when he sees the phantasmal image come down. One of the problems. I imagine he will. Yeah. Well, I mean to be fair, he has a nice first striking wall here, which means that the Garolf's Messengers can't really attack. The scary part is that Garolf's Messenger doesn't really need to attack to deal a lot of damage. Ross Messenger is such a powerful spell. Right, the mana cost really is the, I mean, obviously is the restrictive part of it, but yeah, once you have a deck that can support it, Gross Messenger, one of the best cards in standard. So, Phantasmal Image. Yeah, nothing to come down, put Brad to 14. So Brad has to art in his head, have himself at 10. And Blood Artist from Marlo. So Marlo is going to attempt, I think, to get Brad to zero life without really using, without really attacking. And since, you know, this wall is something that Michael can't really attack through. But Brad can't swing back because then the Gross Messengers will be able to attack back. Yeah, I mean, if Michael was able to draw a Killing Wave here, for example, he Fan might just kill Brad. Phantasmal Image will come down and we'll copy... Another Blade Splicer, and he'll over and he'll play Oblivion Ring this time on the uh, Blood Artist. And that's actually, that's got to be correct. Yeah, you don't, can't really let that stay alive. Uh, there's another. No, remember, there's another Golem token off screen right now. So, Brad with six creatures in play, and in his hand he does have Tamio the Moon Sage. Ooh, wow. It's pretty good. That can actually pick away at the fake Garalt's Messenger. And with, uh, and Mike, with a pretty good five card hand here, just unable to stand up to... Uh, nine power worth of first strike on the other yeah. side of the board. Uh, we talked about how Blade Splicer is one of the best cards here. And when it's drawn in multiples with images to copy them. Right. It's just pretty rough for Mike. And our Moon Sage comes down here. Is that correct though? We do have another... the, the Phantasmal image is set to go is is set to blade splicer i believe oh maybe not yeah so we'll use tammy to actually tap down the real garolf's messenger huh even if he copies the uh ventasmal image michael could return it as a blade splicer right okay and that that that's that's very devastatingly good All right, so Michael, pondering over his options here. Again, uh, you know, I'm pretty interested in a lot of this deck's choices. Three Mortar Pot also seems like a lot of Mortar Pots. Uh, will still will be pretty good in this. If we can get a, a Mortar Pot down with a Blood Artist, that'll be enough to win the game from this five yes. total. So Michael, all right, wasting no, no time against this first striking team. He's going to go with the whole team here. Um, but Brad doesn't want to see the image undie, so he's going to kill the two zombies, lose a blade splicer. Yeah, and that did not do too much. Yeah, that attack... Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah, that attack, I mean, he... Uh... He didn't really, all he did was he took out a Blade Splicer. Okay, so, here's, so we believe Brad's Phantasmal Image is on a Blood Artist. So that last attack then brought Brad up a bunch of life points. Yeah. Alright, so Blade Splicer, so Brad's going to attack back for four. And Michael just... That last attack was almost a concession. Yeah, the, especially with with the fake blood artist and play that attack really. So now Michael will drop to thirteen, and uh, Brad looks in control of the game. And he, he has a Tamio in play too. Right. Not only is he super far ahead, 
Yeah, he also yeah, but he also has a planeswalker on the battlefield. All right, Michael's gonna try to take down the planeswalker. Uh, Restoration Angel's gonna come into play. Blinking Blade Splicer, Blade Splicer making a Golem token. And that's just so good. All right, well, waiting in the finals, we have Ross Miriam, our one lone Delver player in the top eight. 1 2 0 in the other semifinal will play the winner of this match. The lone Delver player? Lone Delver player. Winning 2 0. Quite, quite entertaining. Record fashion. <laughs> Yesterday, I had talked with, with Ross Miriam, who asked, who asked if he would get a feature match at 4 0. And I, when I told him he was playing Delver, I told him, well, I don't really want to feature a Delver deck, but you can take matters into your own hands and. And if you make the if you if you win every round, we'll be forced to feature you. Yeah, kind of said jokingly. He's really taken finals. that to heart, and we're going to get to see Ross on camera in the finals here. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you should just say things like. Congratulations, Ross and Mario. Yeah. All right. So Brad, with an army of of Golem tokens, will take the second game. And these two players going to game three. If you're Ross and you're signing with a classical Delver deck. Um, my guess is you'd prefer to see Michael Marlowe in this game. Uh, the blue-white mid-range deck, well, I'm, it was designed to be a little bit of a foil to Delver. It's kind of so, even. Yeah, yeah. to be fair, I haven't played them both. It. I'm not positive. Yeah. I believe that that's true, but it was at least its intention. I, I, I played a couple matches with the mid-range deck this week. Right. Two matches. Blade, I think the Both of them were against Delver. I won one, I lost one. Yeah. The key is that Blade Splicer presumably lines up very well against Geist of St. Traft. Yeah, but Blade Splicer, you know, Blade Splicer also lets people, like, it doesn't, it doesn't a lot swing of removal, for six. Uh, artifact removal, post board against Vapor, two. Yeah, it lets Vapor Snag yeah. become a very good card. Yeah. And it makes Vapor Snag much better than it's already. Right. And now the Delver lists are playing a couple of dismembers. So like, they have the anti-restoration angel card. Correct. Just one dismember in Brad Shepard's deck. Uh, Ross Mayhem's, I believe, was also weighing the files uh, with one dismember, becoming fairly standard. All right, we have game three between the two of them. Um, Brad Shepard, so we said before, the cards he, he likely is boarding, I said, yeah, we said images. Definitely. Extra images and extra sort of feast and famine. It looks like he has brought in his oblivion ring. And time reinforcements. Yeah, time reinforcements for sure. For sure. Yeah. And probably day of judgment. Brad really becoming more of a control deck here post board. Yeah, day of judgment. Uh, okay here. But uh, you know, day of judgment's definitely good here. It's, uh, it's just it can often uh, well, run the draw. Yeah, it can be a little slow. Not be the best thing in the world. And we have to remember that a lot of Marlowe's cards are uh, Grave Crawlers and Gross Messengers. So depending on the composition of creatures that Michael draws, Day of Judgment may not be the awesome card you want it to be. The card you'd really be looking for on the board here would be Celestial Purge that lots of these decks have as a concession to this matchup. Brad does not have that in his deck list. But if you can get by this matchup anyway, he'll kind of prove that he doesn't need it. I mean, Mike has, uh, Mike has shown us in game one just uh, how explosive this deck can really be. Right. And in that game, Brad had a, uh, a very good defensive drill. He had the Blade Splicer, Michael was forced to two for one himself, and just powered through it. The major issue last game, I mean, if, again, Michael Mulligan a five, if he had been able to two for one that first Blade Splicer, that would have been a much different game. Definitely. Like two for one himself to get rid of the first Blade Splicer, rather. You know what I mean? Right, because the Blade Splicer kept spawning more Blade Splicers, essentially. Yeah. So. The players talking it up a bit. Enjoying their, uh, their semi-final under the bright lights here at SCG Live. I'm pretty excited about Brad's deck being in the top eight of the Invitational, the five color reanimator deck. Yeah, definitely the uh, the the, the Frights deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. For those of you wondering, uh, after that, so we will be following the standard open all the way through the finals. Then we will take a break, and at 11 p 11 a.m. Eastern time, we'll begin coverage of the top eight best of five matches of the Invitational. Yeah. And uh, those matches will include a match that. Uh, between Brian Brunduin 
and his opponent, Michael Hetrick. And uh, Brian is uh, playing this five color deck and it can transform to a sideboard into a deck that's full of Stranglevert guys and Sword of War and pieces. Right, so kind of, yeah, really kind of the, the classical Transform Frights deck. Uh, the difference is that it's switched up its, its large creatures to be on a Image Sun Titan plan. Michael Marlowe's deck, you know, seems pretty sweet. Yeah, I really am. I'm really excited about his deck. Like I said before, um, the zombie, the zombie's archetype is really cool. Uh, it, I, you know, I, I really like the fact that the mono black aggro deck has has as much game to it as it does have. And hopefully, we'll get a seven. Hopefully, we'll get seven cards on each side of the battlefield this time. Michael had mulling to five game two, put up a really good effort on five cards, but ultimately couldn't. Ultimately folded. <laughs> And Michael is going to drop down to six. Brad's keeping it seven. And Michael going down to six cards here. Yeah, gotta gotta be frustrating for him after winning game one to kind of not have his deck perform as as desired. And I mean, his deck's really consistent. You know, there's yeah, it doesn't ask for too much mana wise. So yeah, there's one card that costs more than three mana. Right. Besides his two X spells, so he's uh, one card that costs four, and then two X spells. And then he has he has 21 lands. I mean, it just seems really good. He's got a bunch of one drops and a bunch of two drops. But I mean, his only three drop is Dross Messenger. So he literally has um, four cards that cost more than three, and only four cards that cost three, and then everything else costs one and two. Right. So so he has a low land count of 21, but is which is but is probably okay, especially when you consider he's running for Ponder. And it's good to see uh, players in opens mulligan aggressively. Yeah. That's something that, uh, you know, he had lands and spells there. I feel like we uh, many times see players keep lands and spells too often. Yep. Play this hand can play, so I will play it. As opposed to this hand could be better. All right, so he's going to keep on six. Starting on Gravecrawler. Probably the best turn one play for the deck. See how many, what can he get to start off the game? He does have a Phantasmal Image in his hand. That will probably wait until it has a great target in this matchup. It really has no lack of good targets. And turn two, Mortar Pod comes down. Yeah, not the best thing there, but better than nothing. Well, with Gravecrawler, all it's going to take is one other zombie for Mortar Pod really to earn its own worth here. Uh, the combo is that Gravecrawler can recast itself from the graveyard once you have another zombie. Yeah, I mean, the, the major issue with that is how mana intensive it is. I've seen right. people assemble that on camera, Gravecrawler and Mortipod, many times, but the times I've, the number of those times I've seen somebody actually activate the Mortipod more than twice is maybe once. Right, so Brad Shepard, end step, thought scoured. Uh, his hand full is really playing, level, playing out like a control deck. He has Mana Leak, Vapor Snag, and he's going to try to get, build up to a Gideon Jura that's in his hand. And another Gravecrawler plays around Mana Leak very nicely. Yeah, Gravecrawler is the perfect card there to play. And Shepard is going to just buy himself a little bit of time by Vapor Snagging that that card on instep. Marlow missing his third misses his third land drop. Currently has Brad down to 16. He's gonna have to want to get the pace on a little quicker. Gideon Jura will come down, presumably on turn five here, if Brad can continue to make his land drops. So this ponder uh, helps Brad find a blade splicer here. It's going to be pretty important for him. Now uh, he's going to be able to play that blade splicer on the fourth turn. So right, third land does show up for Michael Marlowe. He knocks Brad down to 14. He's going to recast the grave crawler. Remember, there is a mana leak in Brad's hand, but Michael's trying not to play anything worth mana leaking. So he'll just pass the turn. Seems right. I'm surprised he didn't equip the mortar pod. Sacrifice the German. Equip the mortar pod. That probably, that, yeah. It's, just like it's possible. It's point. possible if Michael ha Michael might have an end step kill spell here that he just thinks feels is more relevant to keep open. Brad will play a fourth line and pass the turn. He does have Restoration Angel, which is what he's representing. And two grape color swing. And Michael will return with a Snapcaster Mage instead of the Restoration Angel. Looking like he's going to try to Snapcaster Mage of Vapor Snag to try to just get additional value. Snapcaster Mage will almost certainly not be able to block, by the way. Uh, this is probably going to be where you'll see Mortar Pod get used. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
You don't want to let that block out. You just get a couple free points out of it. Oh my gosh, you let it block. Wow, and Brad's got to be really happy with that, how that plays. Yeah, I mean, that's... Well, I was surprised about points. that. I would have expected yeah. the mortar pod to have shot it. And then he will... Because it was, he didn't use his man leak, he will then use the vapor snag that he gave fla flash from, flashback on the instep. Fifth land comes down, and Brad will continue to keep his man leak up. I think he's worried about Jarov's messenger. Uh, he'll get a go golem token into play and then pass the turn. Remember, Brad also has Gideon Jura here, and since he's kept himself at 12 life, I think I really like where Brad is in this situation. If you, uh, if you stem the bleeding and then cast the Gideon Jura against an aggro deck, you're usually in a pretty good spot. Phantasmal Image will come down, copying Blade's Blazer. At this point, though, Mana Leak's not becoming as much of a card. And a custom Golem token, it looks like here. Uh, is that uh, Trunks? It's one of them. It's one of those Super Saiyan folks. All right, indeed. So Michael uh, killed the Blade Spicer, went for a, a tragic slip on the Golem token, was unsuccessful at getting it. It got mana leaked. Uh, so we'll just cat recast his other Grave Crawler and pass the turn. All right. Now, the Golem no longer has first strike because the Blade Splicer's not on the table. But uh, just a 3-3. Three, three. So strong. Uh, Brad's at 12. All right, Gideon Jura comes on for Brad. Remember, Brad has to watch out that Mortar Pod with these Grave Crawlers doesn't actually just kill him. Michael's getting to a point where he has quite a dangerous amount of mana. But his draw there, so Gideon decided to tell everything to attack him. Uh, I believe that's a Geth's verdict from Michael. Very strong draw. Drops Brad to 11. This could be, this is dangerous. That's exactly eight power on the board. Knocks Gideon Jura off. Brad Shepard is definitely on the back foot now. So Mortar Pod will equip over to a Grave Crawler. Gonna shoot him for one, drop Brad to 11, and recast the Grave Crawler from the yard. And that's some nice value that Brad, Michael's going to get out of Mortar Pod. Right, the bigger problem which I haven't seen here is that Brad doesn't have many cards that are actually going to answer what Michael's doing right now. Yeah, so Michael now uh, with five lands, he can start mortar potting pretty aggressively. Right. I mean, yeah, he basically has, he has two mana, well, three mana deal of damage. So he has like his own scalding devil kind of. Yeah. But uh, more than enough in this matchup. But I mean, when you're playing this type of matchup and it comes down to a situation like this, your opponent can't really attack you. Right, well, what he can do is he, if he if he grave crawlers the blade splicer away, then Michael's golem will be the only first striking golem on the battlefield. Yeah, and if, uh, if Michael's golem is first striking and Brad's isn't, Michael's going to be winning. Right. All right, we have a uh, little bit of a connection issue right now with the judge. So, I think we might have to break up. All right. You know, it's just a connection issue. No. <laughs> so players here are pausing while we, we figure out the connection issue. But I have to say, I, I, I think Marlo has really established control on this board. Um, one of the bigger problems is, like I said, uh, looking, at, looking at Brad Shepard's list, Brad doesn't... His best late game is in his hand. He had a Gideon. One Gideon's already in the bin. He has another Gideon in his hand, but I'm still just not sure that's enough to get him out of the situation. Which is pretty incredible. I mean, normally when you're playing against any sort of creature-based deck, a Gideon... To a pair of Gideons. A pair of Gideons will definitely be good enough. However, when you've got Giralf's Messengers and yeah. well, Blade Splicers coming at you, it can... Well, well, the internal synergies of zombies are re is really a neat part of the deck. So, I mean, the fact that this mortar pot is online too, definitely a huge help to Michael. Right. Yeah, so. All right, Michael now you're going to pick it back uh, up again here, it looks. Continue playing. All right, so... 
Michael has drawn, it looks like a ponder. Which I believe he's gonna start the turn with. So, Michael leading things off the ponder. Let's see what he's able to find here. Yeah, now, uh, can't really see what Michael's pondering for, but. We'll probably see it soon enough, but yeah. And we'll, we'll know sooner rather than later. What do you think about uh, Blade Splicer over Geist of St. Traft in uh, blue white lists in general? Obviously, in these mid range decks, it's just better because you're Restoration Angeling and you don't need to be as aggressive if you've taken the Delvers out of your deck. But just in general, uh, multiple players made the top eight of the Invitational playing. Delver decks that played Blade Splicer. Yeah, my general opinion is that I still like Guys of St. Traft more. Um, now, uh, not, not to say that, I think Blade Splicer is very interesting in that in these sorts of, this sort of matchup, the Blade Splicer is doing so much more than a Guys of St. Traft does. Uh, however, I still feel like in most of the matchups, the fact that Guys of St. Traft actually is a, like a, oftentimes plays like a 6 6 or 3, I suppose I would prefer that card nonetheless. Makes sense. But what we've seen is with the evolution of decks like this blue-white mid-range deck, we've seen equipment really fall out of favor in the blue-white decks. And when equipment has fallen out of favor, Geist of St. Traft becomes a much more manageable card, and sometimes you just want the more, the more direct impact card, which is Blade Splicer. And I think that's why we're starting to see them come into play. I mean, obviously, Restoration Angel getting printed pushes Blade Splicer up a lot. And then the fact that equipment is at a low is what, is what we're seeing happen. Yeah, I mean, a guys of St. Traft carrying a Sword of War and Peace or Sword of Feast and Famine is right, I mean, quite the force to be reckoned. It's right. almost unbeatable. When the decks, yeah, they're all on um, two war, most one or two Sword of War and Peace. Um, and Brad Shepard's deck just in the main deck has a one Sword of Feast and Famine and nothing else. So, Michael, uh taking his time here, it's really trying to figure out what the correct line of play is. Oh, we have, uh, still having a little bit of technical problems here. So, that's, that's what the pause is about. This is weird, this is like a tilt timer for both players. Yeah, <laughs> we're at the, and at the pivotal point of their match. They're yeah, going to like go to a commercial break. Both opponents yeah. went away to take a bathroom break right now. Right player that tilts more easily. Definitely hurt by that. Yeah, and the hall definitely starting to fill up. Uh, we have our legacy open today, starting an hour, starting at nine o'clock. Eight o'clock is when the stop eight started. Uh, so we're seeing, yeah, a bunch of legacy players starting to file into the hall. Getting ready to sign up. Go yeah. to the booth, pick up some last-minute cards. Well, wait, I mean, so not only is their match being paused, but as as paused, they went from having, you know, a, just a small handful of people to watching to suddenly becoming the feature match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, everybody's starting to crowd around their match here. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a boxing match on the boardwalk. Yeah. In the 1920s. And well, they're in the feature <laughs> match area, but they are the only feature match right now. Yeah. I mean, this is the top four. All right, so we've resolved our ponder. All right. And oh, we're we off. Go. Okay. So, Michael. Uh, oh. Deciding how did I... I mean, I, I think he's move, He's going to move the uh, mortar pot over to a grave crawler. And shoot the shoot the blade that. splicer. Oh, that's, that's the play I'm expecting. To shoot the blade splicer, recast the grave crawler. Yep, and there we go. Right. Okay, now he's going to use Phantasmal Image first. And Seems that will resolve, right. all right. Giving him another Blade Splicer. And another Golem token. Equips, and he equips a Mortar Pod over on, onto Gravecrawler. <coughs> the reason he plays that pre-combat is in case there's a kill spell in Brad's hand for the Phantasmal Image, Michael wants to be sure that his golem keeps first strike, so having a second copy down, really a savvy play on his part. Yeah, He's also... All three. All right, and it looks like there is a vapor snag in Brad's hand. 
to dismember. He's going to dismember the 3 3 token. That puts Brad down to 6, so he has to pay for the dismember. He'll block Gravecrawler and go to 5 from the Phantasmal image. And Michael can't recur Gravecrawler right now. He actually has no more zombies. Because of that, I don't. Uh, if he doesn't have another zombie in his hand, I'm not positive I'm a fan of that play. I don't really want to see him give up his mortar pod combo. Brad will untap and try and play Gideon Jura here. And a great draw for Michael Marlowe. It doesn't really get much better. Yeah. Draw messenger. messenger. Drawing Brad down to um, four. And there we go. There's Stephen Michael Marlowe with the mortar pot on Giralf's messenger has won the match. Moves into the finals against Ross Merriam. We will finally get his feature match. So we'll have blue white Delver, the only Delver.